Well, hello, good everybody, and good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, King's Chambers Business and Planning webinar. Uh, you'll see that there is a, a slide on there which doesn't say that. Uh, we try to be a little bit amusing, and I think I've already thrown one person who's asked the question, are they on the right seminar? So yes, you are. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, my name is Paul Tucker, and I'm acting uh, as I think it's host now rather than chair, I, I need to call myself. And we decided that we would uh, hold a, a quick seminar um, for the next hour or so uh, of our lives to deal with some of the extraordinary changes that have happened over the last few days in terms of the planning system. Uh, the most uh, uh, careful of you will have seen that there seems to be an announcement about every 10 minutes uh, from MHDLG, but there are two in particular that we're going to be focused upon this afternoon, uh, one of which uh, is the Business and Planning Bill, which has now passed its second reading in the Commons uh, and looks set to become law uh, relatively quickly, certainly before the summer recess, and which contains a variety of different in, uh, measures which overlap between planning and licensing, uh, uh, as well as some amendments that are proposed with draft regulations to the Permitted Development Order, the General Permitted Development Order. Uh, that itself will uh, give rise to a number of changes, and John Barrett is going to tell you a few points in relation to those. So to give you the uh, list of who our panellists are, uh, we have Stanzi Bell, who's going to talk to you about uh, hybrid uh, uh, in inquiries and the approach that we'll be taking in relation to, to that in the future. Uh, we've got John Barrett, who's going to tell us a few uh, things in relation to permitted development and how government is taking the breaks on the, uh, a variety of different matters in terms of vertical extensions. Uh, which will be interesting. We've got Martin Carter who's going to tell us what government perhaps should have done some time ago, um, which is what the Scottish government did, which is to look to extend permissions and to introduce primary legislation to allow that to happen. And then to start off with, we've got Sarah Clover, uh, who's going to deal with some of the licensing provisions in the Business and Planning Bill, which plainly have an overlap because government is using uh, this bill uh, as it will be an act in due course, uh, to try and get town centres working again. So in, 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 without any much further ado, can I introduce uh, everybody? Uh, everybody can say hello. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start off with Sarah. Um, Sarah is, uh, if you read our, our chamber's website, it reads like Sarah is the Mary Poppings of the bar. We have lots and lots of references from Legal 500 from uh, satisfied clients. I don't think I've ever had such glowing reviews as uh, you will read when you read on Sarah's webpage. But Sarah is essentially our licensing star at King's. Uh, she is, uh, she's had a meteoric rise in terms of her career. Uh, and Sarah's going to tell us a few things in relation to the uh, planning and, uh, sorry, the business and planning bill, which relate to licensing. Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul, and good afternoon to everybody. I don't know about uh, Mary Poppins. That would make me good, and I'm not often accused of that. Um, I am going to be addressing the, the licensing elements uh, of the, the business and, and planning bill. Um, licensing, as, as Paul has very kindly said, is, is one of my specialist subjects and uh, what a roller coaster ride uh, we have had in the last few weeks, if not months, from uh, being told in the week running up to the 20th of March that licensed premises um, could stay open but that people were being advised not to go to them. Um, to our final lockdown uh, that following Monday, was it the 21st, 22nd of, of March, uh, and really the hospitality industry at that point um, fell off a, a cliff, uh, and it has been a very difficult and stressful time for licensed premises, hospitality premises, uh, with the first ray of light perhaps showing up this Saturday, the 4th of July, with the ability to reopen again but under what circumstances and with what consequences we really can't say um, and I, I think uh, there's a lot of consternation about that but in the midst of all of that preparation all of that um, uh, anxiety about what was going to happen this weekend in drops the business and planning bill and there was a, a flurry if not a, a panic uh, of activity trying to uh, figure out where uh, this new bill would fit in in licensing terms, in terms of relationship to the Licensing Act 2003 and the preparations for the weekend. And I think there's been a very um, strong uh, impression amongst uh, licensees and the regulators that this bill was going to be in, in time for the weekend uh, to influence how premises were going to reopen. That is not the case. In fact, that there's some uh, disappointment in that regard, because although, as Paul said, 
uh, having been introduced on the 25th of June and having been rattled through its first stages in the Commons, uh, we now get to learn that this is going to crawl, uh, relatively speaking, I have to say, um, through the Lords. So the next reading is due on the 6th of July. It'll be in committee on the 13th of July. Um, possible third reading on the 20th of July. All of this means at the very earliest we could possibly see uh, the law coming in would be the 21st of July and it probably won't be. So we're looking towards the tail end uh, of July for this all to become law. Um, and for the elements that I'm talking about, there will be application, for some of it, there will be application procedures to follow on after that for, uh, for two weeks. And so we're really talking about getting into August, which of course is just in time to lose uh, the, the best of the weather, the good weather, that this is all predicated uh, upon. There are two elements of the bill that I want to touch on. I haven't got a great deal of time, so it will be a real rattle through. But uh, let me tell you that we have done some very comprehensive guidelines and frequently asked questions, uh, which we can distribute afterwards and, and you can take a more detailed look at those. But the two elements of the bill uh, that I'm uh, addressing today are in relation to um, a change to the Licensing Act 2003 to provide for off sales. And I'll talk about that in a little uh, moment in a, in a bit more detail and, and to kick us off um, pavement uh, licenses, which is a, a licensing planning uh, crossover. Um, I had a, a webinar with uh, local authorities jumping on uh, yesterday. Um, we, we tried to conceive of something on Monday, publicised it on Tuesday, did the webinar yesterday and we had uh, in excess of uh, 250 delegates uh, on that and so the, the, the level of consternation about what is going on, what is this uh, all about, it is very high indeed. Well pavement licences, this is trying to capture uh, what you may have seen um, put around in the press as the, the al fresco revolution, the, the, the cafe culture, there's a campaign also called the Great Summer outdoor cafe and really this is where the licensing act 2003 came in all those years ago more than 10 years ago now on the promise of deregulating licensing and, and bringing in a uh, cafe culture well that worked quite well um, in places like Marseille and Barcelona and Milan less so in Birmingham or Manchester Leeds maybe we're getting our, our second shot at this I, I don't know but of course the reality is that pavement uh, licenses this new facility that the bill is offering us is more about allowing businesses to use space being outdoors spreading people out is one very good way to try and cut down on the transmission of the virus and that is what this part of the bill is trying to capture and it sounds very simple it, it sounds as though it is simply a question of allowing businesses to put chairs and tables out on the space around them the pavements and the, the road uh, next to them uh, in normal times an act as simple as that bumps into about five different regulatory uh, regimes so this is not really as simple uh, as it looks and normally to have a pavement license or a tables and chairs license you'd be looking at a, a permit under the highways act 1980 going to the county council the highways authority to talk about obstructing the highway you may very well be talking about a change of use requiring planning permission um, particularly in london you would be talking about street trading you'd need a street trading license uh, and uh, a number of different uh, regulations are engaged so the pavement license provision in this new bill is designed to sweep by and bypass all of those different regulatory uh, roadblocks it's a temporary opportunity it uh, it will last up until the 30th of september of next year as a maximum uh, licensing authorities are being asked to grant a minimum of three months for those who want one of these brand new um, pavement licenses and uh, the, the application is made to a local authority hence the consternation hence my well-stocked webinar yesterday because this is a this is a new one for most uh, local authorities uh, equate a local authority to a licensing authority uh, that's the the body that's going to be administering these new pavement licenses and that they are uh, a little bit headless chicken about it at the moment so who can apply for a pavement license well this is going beyond just licensees with a premises license this is anybody 
uh, with a business that actually uses or proposes to use, so they haven't got to be doing it just yet, but they propose to use uh, the, the highway adjacent to their premises for that, for that business purpose. Uh, and the, the uses that we're talking about are food and drink provision, so traditional pubs, wine bars, other drinking establishments, uh, or food establishments, but also any business that proposes to add food and drink to their business offering. So you can actually be talking about businesses that have got nothing traditionally to do with food and drink. Maybe a hairdresser, for example, might want to use their pavement space to offer teas and coffees, that kind of thing. They too, if they propose to do that thing, can have a pavement license. And you might also be talking about a, a delicatessen. Uh, yesterday we decided that a cheese shop uh, could have a pavement license and it all went a little bit Monty Python but it just demonstrates the breadth of, of, um, of this authorization and it doesn't have to be a business that they would uh, already be using indoors in order to have this facility outdoors. You don't have to have a premises license under the Licensing Act 2003 to have the pavement license but there's been a little bit of confusion as to whether these pavement licenses are making any difference to a licensed um, premises, lic a premises license, that they don't. The premises license remains exactly as it is. So the hours, the license of activities, the conditions and so on remain exactly the same. This really is just about space and what you can do in that space. What space are we talking about? Well, we're talking about adjacent. That's the, the word that the bill has, has hit upon. Adjacent to a relevant highway. Highway as uh, defined in the Highways Act, uh, and that's all specified, adjacent, well not necessarily immediately abutting or contiguous, it can be uh, a little further afield, but not necessarily walking down the road. I had some questions cropping up in the webinar yesterday uh, about, uh, well, could it be a car park? Uh, could it be a, a park, a public park or a village green? And the answer is, well, well, no, the, the, the clue is in the title. This is a, a pavement license defined as a as highway, uh, and that is where it is restricted to. And, and if you have to start walking down the road to get to this space, that won't do either. So related to adjacent to the business premises that we're talking about. And what do you get with your premise, with your pavement license? Well, it, it's all about furniture. Uh, you have the um, permission to place removable furniture on the highway, on the pavement, uh, for the purposes of either selling your food and drink or allowing your customers to, to consume it and, and to uh, take advantage of it. Your pavement license bypasses planning permission. You don't need planning permission. You don't need a street uh, trading permit either, should you otherwise have needed that. Uh, th this uh, allows you uh, to bypass those regulations. Furniture is defined. I won't take lots of time telling you what is in and what is out. We're on a fairly tight timetable today, but you would look within the bill and see a list of what furniture means. It's, it's fairly uh, regular, understandable stuff. So it was going to be chairs and tables, counters, shelves, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's a, it's a complete definition. You can't choose something that's not in the list and put that on the highway. How do uh, applicants go about making the application? Well, again, this was the, the, the cause of some feather ruffling and, and consternation within the local authorities because they don't have a system in place uh, as yet. It's an electronic application. Uh, local authorities can put up a form if they have the time and the opportunity to do so, but they don't have to. It could simply be a, an email application sent in. It will need to have a list of pieces of information, some specified in the bill and some for the local authority to specify for themselves if they choose to do that thing, if they can in fact get themselves organised. And of course, we're talking about up to September of next year, so although there may be a flurry and a rush in the early days, once things settle down, it may well be that local authorities uh, get themselves a little bit more organised for, for future applications in a way that they can't quite manage at this stage. There is an application fee, uh, but part of uh, what the government is trying to do is to streamline this and make it cheaper. So the application fee is um, capped at £100. Local authorities can charge less or, or nothing at all if they choose to do that. Uh, they're likely to want their £100. It's not really going to cover their costs in any event. So expect that. 
the applicant will send in their electronic application. They then put a notice up on their premises to tell everybody who's interested that they've done that thing. And then a public consultation period begins. And just watch this one because the bill itself is talking about a seven day, seven straight day consultation period followed by a seven straight day uh, determination period for the local authority. The guidance that's come out uh, about this that's been posted up by .gov.uk, uh, it talks about five working days plus five working days. Now those are not the same thing. They're, they may sound like it, but in certain circumstances, discounting public holidays and the like, they are not. So we're going with the bill, it's seven straight days and the day after the, the, the period is finished, the next uh, seven days begins within which the local authority must make their uh, decision. They need to consult, local authority need to consult the highways authority, they need to consult uh, with uh, local people. Local people have the right to make representations if they see that notice up or they spot it on the local authority website. Representations come in, local authority considers everything and they make their decision. There can be conditions, local authority can come up with their own list of conditions, there's likely to be uh, statutory conditions, um, Secretary of State conditions um, posted up. We only have one of those yet. Um, local authority conditions will take precedence, um, but Secretary of State conditions will jump in if there's a gap. And there might be a gap because if local authorities don't get these pavement license applications through within that very tight window, there's a deemed grant. So the license will be granted uh, it will be granted for uh, a deemed period of a year and it will be granted with any local conditions that have already been published and any Secretary of State conditions as well so that they, they won't be completely free for all. Uh, but that's the safety net if the local authority don't get round to it. If the local authority do get round to it, they can take a more considered approach and they can nuance the, the requirements that they add, taking into account uh, their local conditions and so forth. Um, there is a required no obstruction condition, which either needs to come out because the local authority put it on or because it's, uh, it's a Secretary of State condition. And that, that no obstruction condition, uh, there, there's various elements to it, but essentially what it is saying is don't allow the licensee to do something that is going to obstruct the traffic doing what traffic normally wants to do, moving up and down the highway, getting access to buildings, emergency services, um, statutory services, that kind of thing. Uh, there are enforcement powers, as so the local authority could revoke or amend a license once it's been granted. Uh, there is no right of appeal built into the bill at this stage, although the guidance encourages local authorities to provide a, a facility to appeal uh, through them. They, they may not be gagging to do that in the early days. Uh, we will see. So that's my rattle through pavement licenses. Uh, it is intended to facilitate the great alfresco revolution. Uh, whether it actually uh, does that or not, who knows? Alcohol licensing is a quick one. I can just take you through that very quickly. It relates to off sales. For a premises license, uh, for the sale of alcohol, you can do that on your premises within the red line or for consumption off your premises so people take the alcohol away and what the bill is doing is saying if you don't already have that facility for off sales you'll automatically get it for the same hours as your premises license if you've already got off sales and people can already buy alcohol from you to take away that's great the bill will give you three exemptions to any conditions that you might have on that so your hours will automatically get bumped up to the same hours as your own license but it doesn't have to be in a sealed uh, container uh, and um, you can now deliver to people's doors as well. So there are three deregulations. If that all goes horribly wrong, the responsible authorities have got a power to bring that in front of the local authority on a, on a rapid review, a summary review, in order to take that away from you. And that is my canter through. I hope that was a rapid fire enough for you. Sorry about that. It is what it is. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. I think my head's hurting now after that, that rapid fire through. Uh, but you made it very clear. Just a couple of questions uh, that have come up, and I should have said at the very outset, please use the Q&A function on the bottom to ask any questions. If we don't answer them during the session, we'll try to answer them afterwards. Uh, and as Sarah's very uh, kindly indicated, there's guidelines that uh, she's happy to make available. Uh, so if you just drop an email to our clerks and they'll forward those uh, through her. 
Um, so you, can I just pick one of those questions to ask then, Sarah, uh, very quickly, which is the interaction between the Town and Country Planning Act and a pavement licence. Do you need separate planning permission if you secure a pavement licence? No. No, the bill is specifically bypassing planning permission. If you get the pavement licence, you've automatically got any planning permission you would have needed to go with. Uh, and tragically, I can't ask you the question about enforcement and then use the gag about Stilton spilling on the pavement. But thank you very much indeed for the anonymous person that asked that. I love that. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Ordinarily, I'd ask you to uh, ask the delegates to clap, but that probably would be a little pointless in everybody's uh, offices and front rooms. Uh, so thank you, Sarah. I know you have to depart. So we're very, very grateful. And if there are any questions afterwards, please fire those through to Sarah. And as I say, we'll try and answer the questions which have been asked in the Q&A. Thank so, you. Thank you, everybody. So moving from Sarah, can I ask Martin to uh, uh, bring himself forward? Hello, Paul. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, I've got a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share the content of that uh, with you now, hopefully. Well, as Martin is doing that, can I just introduce what Martin's going to talk about? Martin's going to talk about the issue of extending planning consent, uh, which is an issue that's been ra that's raised its head throughout the uh, the, the, uh, the UK and uh, in Scotland, they've been doing it for a considerable period of time. Uh, Martin every will be familiar to everybody uh, on the call, I've no doubt, uh, but he's one of the one of the one of our our uh, profession's uh, nicest uh, individuals and most able practitioners. And if you read through his uh, 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 rec recommendations on the, on the Chamber's website, you'll see capable, personable, exceptional uh, come up time and time again. Those entirely coincide with my experience of Martin. So, Martin, take it away. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you, everybody. Nice to be with you. Um, I'm going to be talking about extending planning permissions, as Paul says. It's a rather mechanistic subject, which breaks itself up into a number of categories. And as Paul was saying at the beginning, I think a lot of people were hopeful that this was going to be sorted out earlier than it looks like it's going to be. And the consequence is that we've ended up with a rather messy system where a split, split batches of categories of um, permissions are now being talked about, as I'll take you through. What the um, proposal involves is the introduction of a new set of three clauses of the bill, they would introduce a whole raft of new sections after section 93 in the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. And broadly speaking, the proposals fall into six categories, which I will take you through now. The first category is um, what they're calling the automatic extension of certain planning permissions. And that would be achieved by the insertion of a new section 93A into the Planning Act. And it would apply if each of three criteria are met. And the first criterion in relation to this category of extension is that the permission has to be what the bill calls a relevant planning permission. And that's defined later on in the same clause as being a permission other than um, one that falls within a whole list. And basically, it's permissions granted by a development order, they're exempted. Permissions granted by an enterprise zone or a simplified planning zone, they're also exempted. Permissions which are deemed to be granted under Section 90 of the, of the Act, that's things like Electricity Act consents, where you get a deemed planning permission, they don't count for present purposes. And importantly, outline planning permission, because as we'll see in a moment or two, they're dealt with as a separate category. So it, basically speaking, it's full planning permissions is the main thing that um, this particular provision is aiming at. The second criterion is straightforward. The permission must relate to land in England. And then the third criterion in relation to this category of extension is that the permission has to have had a condition attached to it, which require the development to be begun, but um, within a window which starts on the date when clause 17 of the bill comes into effect and at the moment in the bill provides that that's going to be 28 days after the act is passed and the end date of the window is the 31st of December 2020. So it's looking at permissions which are going to expire at some point in the future from now. If those three criteria are met then the effect is that the condition that we are talking about would be deemed to provide that development has to be begun by no later than the 1st of April 2021. 
There's a, a slight um, wrinkle to note in relation to this category of, of extension, which comes from section 91, three capital B of the Planning Act. That's a provision that says that if, a, if the validity of a full grant of planning permission relating to a grant of permission uh, for land in England, if that's challenged in the courts, then the condition requiring the development to be begun is to be taken as extended by one year from the date which would otherwise apply. And to deal with that provision, the bill does two things. It, it says that if section 913B would have the effect of extending the condition to a date that falls within the window, then the provision in the bill would extend that further to the 1st of April 2021. Uh, but if, if the position is that the um, deemed extension under section 913B would otherwise extend the permission beyond the 1st of April 2021, then that's not going to happen. So um, the combination of this proposed provision and section 913B can never get you, in short, to a start date that's after the 1st of April 2021. The second category is um, what they're calling um, additional environmental approvals, and that is proposed to be in a new section 93B of the Planning Act. Again, there are three criteria. The first two are the same as for the previous category. It's a relevant planning permission, same definition applies. It again has got to apply to um, land in England, the permission. And then there's a different window for the condition requiring the development to start. This time the window is one that started on the 23rd of March, i.e. when the legal lockdown kicked in and ends with the date when clause 17 of the bill would come into effect. So it's looking at permissions which would otherwise have expired at some point in the past by the time we get to the, the act being passed. If the criteria are met, then what happens is that there is an ability to apply for um, an additional approval. That could be made to the local planning authority. It would have to be made by a person with an interest in the land or by their agent. It has to be in writing, it's got to be electronic, it's got to let the authority know which permission and which condition it's referring to. And perhaps somewhat troublesomely, I think, it's got to give sufficient information to allow the authority to consider it. And that might cause problems as we'll see in a moment. The authority would then have 28 days to determine it. It can be extended up to no more than 21 days in total. And if the authority missed the de determination date, there would be a deemed approval. What would the criteria be for determining these uh, additional environmental approval applications? Um, we're going to be getting guidance from the Secretary of State, which I would imagine is going to be fairly optimistic in telling authorities to do it if they can. But there's an important pair of caveats to note. The authority could only approve the application if what they're calling the EIA requirement and the habitats requirement are both met. So what are they? Well, the EIA requirement would be met if either no development within the permission is EIA development, or if it is, then if a reason conclusion for granting the permission had been incorporated into it, which should have happened because that's a legal requirement under the EIA regulations, and if the authority is satisfied that the conclusion remains up to date, as is already set out in regulation 26.2 of the EIA regulations for different purposes, then the EIA regulation is met and the uh, approval could be granted. The habitats requirement is similar but slightly different. The bill says that that would be met if when the authority was considering the um, whether to grant planning permission, if the authority was considering whether to grant planning permission at the date it was considering the AEA application, if either no habitats regulations assessment would have been required or if it would, then such an assessment was already carried out when the permission was granted and the assessment had shown that there would be no adverse effect on the European site. And if the authority think that assessment remains up to date at the time it's considering the AEA application, then the habitats requirement would be met. The effect of an, um, an AEA would then be to extend the life of the planning permission to the 1st of April 21, 21 date again. There will be no ability to extend it by any other means. Importantly, 
the AEA could not have any conditions attached to it. It's a binary matter. It either gets a yes or no, and yes means the life of the permission is extended. And the bill says that you won't be able to grant or have deemed to be granted an AEA after the end of this year. There's a right of appeal proposed under Section 78 of the Planning Act. They're going to have to get their skates on in determining those if many of those are made, given the timescales in involved. And the Secretary of State would have the power to change some of the dates in the various windows in the provisions which he would be able to make by regulations. The next category is outline planning permissions um, and reserve matters applications, uh, a new section 93D. That would apply, again, three criteria. This time, permission is an outline one. Secondly, the land is in England. And thirdly, the permission has a condition that would require the making of a reserve matters application by a date which fell between the start of lockdown and the end of this year. Straightforward provision. If those three criteria are met, then there's an automatic extension. There would be an automatic extension for the making of a reserve matters application until the 1st of April 2021. The next category of extension is about the time for beginning development in outline planning permissions, a proposed new section 93E. Again, three criteria. Firstly, it's an outline permission. Secondly, it's land in England. And thirdly, there would be a condition requiring the development to begin by a date which fell between the date when clause 18 takes effect. And again, that's proposed to be 28 days after the act is passed and the end of the year. And again, entirely automatic process. If all of those criteria are met, then the condition requiring the development to begin is deemed to be amended as though the extension was given to the 1st of April next year. There's a similar provision for additional environmental approvals in respect of outline planning permissions. That's proposed to be in a new section 93F of the Planning Act. I can deal with that extremely quickly because the provisions are identical to those that we looked at earlier on in relation to both having the EIA and the habitats requirements, no material difference at all. The Secretary of State would again have the opportunity to um, make minor amendments to dates in the various provisions by the regulations and there would also be the same right of appeal under section 78. The final matter to conclude this fairly um, swift trot through the provisions that are in this part of the bill is a provision that's proposed to be made in relation to listed building consents. And here they are um, suggesting adding a new section 18A into the Listed Buildings Act. That would apply if there's a listed building consent in force which relates to a building again in England and secondly that listed building consent has a condition which requires works to be begun no later than a date which falls in a window between the start of lockdown 23rd of March and the end of this year. If the criteria are met then again entirely automatic process the condition would be deemed to require works to commence by the 1st of April 2021 and again, the Secretary of State would have the power made by regulations to um, change some of the dates in various parts of the windows in, in relation to that matter too. So that's my um, hopefully not too swift trot through these provisions. They are quite mechanistic, but once you sort of get the feeling as to how they work, there's a definite rhythm to them. So uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Martin. Uh, if you just bring your slideshow to a close, that'd be fantastic. Um, uh, obviously, I am mentally clapping along with the several hundred delegates that are currently on the call who I know that clapping at the same time. That's extremely <laughs> useful. A um, couple of questions, uh, one of which is from Alan Nichols, which I assume to be a joke, given that I don't think I've encountered one of these. Uh, do the provisions apply to, perm to permissions in principle, Martin? Um, well, they're not excluded, so I think they possibly would. I suppose the corollary is, have you ever seen a permission in principle? Uh, no, but I know that um, I know that Alan's been dealing with some because he's been tweeting about them. Ah, excellent. Well, maybe it wasn't a joke then. I've done an entire disservice, so apologies to him. Um, I, I've got a, uh, a, a question, really. Um, environmental permitting, uh, the yeah. notion of a default approval of an environmental impact assessment. Yeah, interesting one, isn't it? How, how, how usual is that, do we think? Um, I, I think that there's a, there's a real difficulty there in the way that it's drafted at the moment. Certainly as regards... 
our, ex, uh, our compliance with the transitional period for leaving the EU, um, as I understand it, you can't have a deemed consent if you've got EIA development. So that, that causes big problems until at least the end of the year. But whether, whether any case will ever come to fruition, so to speak, in, in time for that to be a real issue, I don't know. But it is, a, it is an interesting part of the provisions and I, causes me a little bit of discomfort, if I'm honest. OK, thank you very much indeed, Martin. I know there's a couple of other questions that, that have been left hanging on the Q&A, uh, which, uh, again, we, we will deal with in writing. So those will be deferred to you, Martin, if that's uh, OK. And uh, apologies, we're not, not answering them all live, but you will get your responses. So thank you very much indeed, Martin. If I can now bring John Barrett uh, to the fore. This is where I hope John hasn't gone off for a cup of coffee. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, delighted to see you there. Uh, and uh, John, if you want to start sharing your screen and start bringing your seminar up, and I'll uh, briefly introduce you to the, uh, uh, to the audience. Uh, uh, John is a uh, senior junior, one of the most eminent uh, juniors that we have uh, in, in Kings. And I'm very disappointed having uh, reminded myself of uh, John's website uh, address on the King's Chambers website that the word ferocious no longer appears as one of the uh, the quoted, uh, quoted uh, um, accolades. He has many, many accolades on the website, but ferocious was always my favourite. So I'm disappointed not to see that, John. So that'll be my entry for next year's uh, uh, Legal 500 when describing you. John Barrett is now going to talk to us about permitted development right extensions. And it's fair to say this is a bit of a moving feast, given that uh, I think even as uh, late as an hour and a half ago, uh, Robert Jenrick was saying that we're going to extend the use classes order uh, for a whole new series of uh, use class of commercial and business. So th this may be part one of a series of shows that John will do. John, I'm, over to you. I'm happy to do so. The minute I get my slideshow up, which is not playing with me at the moment. I think if you press forward, you should get through them now. I think you've actually started it already. OK, fine. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, not quite as exciting as the subject matter that uh, Martin was dealing with, but one of the vehicles that our government will use and uh, to some effect to build, 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 which is the expression the Prime Minister used yesterday, is to deploy permitted development rights. It's one of the features of all our governments of whichever complexion that when an economic crunch comes, development is encouraged. It's encouraged by the issuing of new guidance, and I'm expecting that there will be a new framework in the not too distant future. But one of the easiest mechanisms is actually through permitted development rights, granting planning permission for a range of developments that can be deployed without further intervention by the local planning authority. Now, the focus of this paper is actually um, the increase in height permitted to some apartment developments. Uh, but nevertheless, I am proposing just to take a quick run through of some of the other uh, permitted development rights that have been created. Um, the most obvious and perhaps the least controversial is the emergency development. You will probably be aware of just simply watching the news that amendments were made to the 2015 order that permitted emergency development. Uh, this allowed bodies to develop on land owned, leased or occupied by, or maintained by them for the purposes of preventing an emergency or mitigating the effects of emergency or taking other action in connection with an emergency. Those of you, and I expect this is all of you who have any experience of permitted development rights, will be the first to recognise that permitted development rights often state the blindingly obvious and the emergency development process is no different because development is not permitted if the development is on land which is a military explosive storage area, a triple SI, contains a scheduled monument uh, or is within five meters of a residential curtilage. The thought that somebody could seriously contemplate putting perhaps a Nightingale hospital immediately next to a military explosive area boggles uh, the mind but it is nevertheless for the avoidance of doubt they can't do it. Uh, it is subject to a condition that it must cease by the end of this year and uh, there's a requirement then to remove any structures that have been erected and restore the land. 
I suspect, although there's nothing to indicate this is the case just at the moment, that this is going to be extended. But as it's not a particularly controversial aspect, I don't think we need to uh, detain ourselves too much. The, the next matter that we can look at really is um, following the lockdown, the what I've described as the national cat catastrophe begins to unfold. And uh, I, I thank the Liverpool Echo for this picture. Uh, restaurants and pubs closed. As Sarah just explained, the licensing uh, industry fell off. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt, John, but I, I think that your slideshow isn't showing up on the, the, the screen. Ah, uh, right. Okay. That's the, that's the need some. I'll, I'll, I'll cover and, uh, and answer a question whilst you're uh, just sorting out the, the technology, if that's okay. Yeah. I think you may need to un unshare and then share the actual slideshow. Ah, there you go. You've, you've now started moving through them. Excellent. I shall not cover. Uh, I'll, I'll let you get on with it. Thank you, John. Okay, well, um, I, I was just explaining this uh, for the same reason that Sarah did. The entertainment industry fell off a cliff as soon as lockdown occurred um, and all pubs, restaurants had closed. Partly to address that, um, we had changes to hot food takeaway provisions. Essentially, it was a lifeline thrown to restaurants, cafes and pubs, came into force on lockdown, 24th March, and amended the order to introduce a new class DA. And that allows a change of use from a building and land within its curtilage from uh, A3 restaurants and cafes, A4 drinking establishments, mixed uses, uh, and uh, drinking establishments with expanded food provision. The nature of the benefit that uh, those existing activities get is that there's a temporary permission essentially that allows them to sell um, hot food, food off the premises. Uh, conditions require them to uh, notify the local planning authority if the building is being used uh, for this purpose and perhaps importantly um, once that change of use had occurred the effect of premises taking advantage of this particular permitted development right right da doesn't affect their previous use because one of the legal arguments was always that if, you, if there had been an a3 use it converted to a new use you needed planning permission to resume the use Again, um, one of the proposals has, to, has been to extend the temporary use of land. The new permitted development right was introduced by Regulation 20 of the uh, 2020 regulation, brings into force on the recently 25th of June, what amounts to an extension of existing permitted development rights. So the new right allows you to, between the 25th of June 2020 and the end of December, of this year, the use of any land for any purposes for not more than 28 days. And that's in addition to the existing 28 day permission that's already in class B of part four of the 2015 order. Uh, the exception is that you've got another 14 days in respect of the holding of a market uh, or a temporary use of land, 14 days for motor car and motorcycle racing, including trials and practicing the, the activities. Um, One of the exclusions, perhaps interestingly, is that um, those don't, do not extend to the use of a listed building or its curtilage. Can't do that if it's a caravan site and you can't use a triple SI where the use is for either motor vehicle racing, clay pigeon shooting um, or war games. Local authorities have probably suffered as a consequence of the coronavirus and the lockdown because markets, and I know Manchester City Council, for example, took advantage of the ability to have um, themed markets. They are, were focused obviously around Christmas, but, but at other holidays as well. The uh, German markets was a particular favorite of mine. The uh, Regulation 21 deals with markets held by local authorities or on their behalf, and they are now permitted at any time between the 25th June and 23rd March 2021. Uh, the pictures there for your interest, that 
<clears throat> the Lowry is the linoleum market in Oldham, my hometown, and the bottom left reflects Hong Kong, it's actually Kowloon, night market, and because the markets are permitted at any time, I thought I'd share that thought with you um, without the interference of the Chinese authorities. Right, let's turn to this main subject matter of uh, my talk. Um, we see there our beloved uh, Secretary of State. I can't imagine what subliminal thought went through my head when I left the Daily Express logo uh, above his head, <clears throat> but I'll leave you to ponder that. Now, Regulation 22 inserts Part 20 to the 2015 uh, order. And this allows blocks of flats uh, to be extended upwards by a maximum of two stories. Uh, and for these purposes, dwelling houses as defined in this rather convoluted provision means flats for this uh, permitted development right. And associated with it, of course, is any associated engineering operations access and plant replacement. So if you need a new lift shaft um, extending above that, then that's permitted by this. The headline um, is that this should be relatively straightforward, but it's actually quite complex. It's also being presented as a coronavirus response, but in truth, it's been in a long time coming. It follows on from an October 2018 uh, consultation, planning reform, supporting the high street and increasing the delivery of new homes. That was the initiative of the previous Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, be that as it may, this is where we are now. These provisions come into force in August, 1st of August. They, they will be welcome, I think, particularly for developers of apartment blocks, particularly on the coast. Paul and I were discussing just before the seminar began. Uh, one could imagine where the owners of the apartment block is a single person. Um, and we had in mind, for example, retirement apartments will be a classic. This will be a particularly welcome and opportune moment for them to take advantage of these provisions. I also think that they'd be very useful for developers of existing apartment blocks where they are in particularly valuable locations, and I have in mind the coast, particularly the South Coast, coast and I was thinking in terms of Bournemouth, Poole, Christchurch, as well as Lytham St Anne's and the uh, East Coast uh, around the more attractive uh, coastal villages and towns in uh, Yorkshire. There are a number of preconditions. The building has to be detached, at least three stories high and constructed between uh, 1st July 1948, the start of planning legislation and the 5th of March 2018. The significance of that latter date being the consultation period that began with that MHLG uh, consultation exercise. Secondly, the building is excluded if its use was granted by um, permitted development rights. Um, the most significant for these purposes is if, for example, planning permission being granted for the change of use from offices to um, residential, th this new permitted development right does not, does not extend to that residential, new residential use. The building once completed can't exceed 30 metres in height and buildings are excluded if they are within a conservation area, National Park, AONB, Triple SI, they are a listed building or a scheduled monument or lands within their curtilage. That does not prevent them, however, from being within the setting of listed buildings or in framework terms, the setting of a conservation area. Um, prior approval is a requirement of the new right before beginning the development, prior approval must be sought for um, impacts and information provided in relation to the following impacts, transport and highways, contamination and flood risk, external appearance, and the provision of natural light in all habitable rooms. Uh, air traffic has to be considered and the amenity of existing and neighboring buildings, including overlooking privacy and loss of light, uh, and impacts on protected views have to be the subject matter of reports that are required to be submitted 
at the time of the application. There's one further report that has to uh, be submitted, and that's what's called a construction report, which must be submitted setting out how the construction will be managed. Now, this is quite an important consideration, perhaps more, more usual than others in terms of a straightforward development proposal, because one anticipates that there are existing residents in the apartment or in the, uh, the block which is proposed to be extended. And it will be important uh, for those considerations to be taken in, into account in the course of the determination of it. This is perhaps a, an unusual prior approval procedure because it's getting very, very close to what would be a conventional planning application. There is a specific procedure associated with it. Um, it includes a list of information that must accompany the application and the bodies that must be consulted, depending, for example, if it's affecting a trunk road, depending, for example, if it's in a flood risk area. The local planning authority is obliged to publish the application by way of site notice and notice to neighbours. Um, when determining the application, then the local planning authority must have regard to self-evidently the representations received in response to the consultation and the framework specifically mentioned in the same way as if it were a planning application. They must determine the prior approval within eight weeks. But unlike so many other uh, permitted development rights involving prior approval, there is in fact no deemed approval if the local planning authority fails to issue uh, within that period a decision. Uh, there is a right of appeal for non-determination, which is broadly for all intents and purposes exactly that as under the Act itself. The development must not begin before prior approval is received and must uh, be carried out in accordance with the approved details. Prior approval can be granted unconditionally or subject to conditions that reasonably relate to the subject matter of the approval. In other words, uh, for the purposes of the prior approval conditions, the only conditions that will be capable of being imposed will be those that relate to the matters that have to be submitted as part of the application. Then turning to what the local planning authority must do, well, the provisions allow the local planning authority to refuse an application where the development doesn't comply with the restrictions imposed on the developer, uh, or a developer provides insufficient information in the opinion of the local planning authority to enable the local planning authority to decide that particular issue. In terms of the other issues, I touched upon traffic earlier, the uh, application can be refused where it would result and these are the words that they use in a material increase or a material change in the character of traffic in the vicinity of the site. Extremely woolly wording. Uh, one would anticipate a rich vein of litigation to be uh, coming out of that. Local planning authorities preventing, prevented from making a grant of prior approval, uh, contrary to the advice of the operators of an aerodrome, technical site or a defense asset. It's quite unusual that one sees almost a delegation of the ability to refuse an application given to specific consultees. Uh, if the local planning authority determines that the site will be contaminated land, and that's part of the information that has to be submitted with the application, the local planning authority is obliged, the words are there, they must refuse to give prior approval. It's also worth noting one of the concerns that had emerged over the exercise of previous permitted development rights, particularly in London, was the associated um, lack of amenity for future residents because so many of the uh, rooms created in the uh, new apartments didn't have any natural light. And it's perhaps worth noting that applications must be accompanied now by detailed plans that show the position of the windows and doors and the local planning authority, again, the imperative is to refuse prior approval if uh, adequate natural light is not provided in all the habitable rooms. Um, conditions. The new flats may only be used for uh, class three residential purposes. The development has to be completed within three years. If there is a sill in place, it will be payable on the new floor space that is created. And uh, perhaps importantly for local planning authorities, if they are unhappy with the uh, 
implementation of such permitted development rights, they can withdraw uh, the PD rights under Article 4 of the 2014, uh, 2015 order, I beg your pardon, in the usual way. And uh, amendments were actually made to the Town and Country Planning Compensation England regulations that would limit the local planning authority's compensation liability in the event that it issues an Article 4 direction. Um, in short, these are uh, robust provisions. I think they'll be very attractive to a number of developers and they will provide an opportunity to develop um, high value sites without further intervention really by a local planning authority provided they go through the tick box uh, exercise that I've indicated. They will have to provide substantive evidence of the matters that we've discussed. I think in terms of practitioners, one of the things, again, to bear in mind is that where you have an existing block of facts, you obviously have existing rights associated with it. Uh, if it's the landlord effectively that's seeking planning permission, one of the aspects of due diligence that must be gone through, in my view and, uh, and on the basis of my advice, would be to carefully check what rights the existing tenants have. Because in order to succeed in this development and be capable of, uh, of it being implemented, the private legal rights that may well be associated with such development will have to be taken on board. Uh, these won't prevent the grant of planning permission as a matter of principle, but they will have to be grappled with if as a matter of practice, this is going to come to fruition. Uh, thank you very much. That completes my quick run through of the permitted development rights, particularly in relation to the uh, extension upwards of apartment blocks. Thank you very much indeed, John. I uh, don't know about anybody else. Uh, all I heard from that talk was that the east coast of Yorkshire is an absolutely beautiful place. And since that's where I come from, that's everything else I, I, I just zoned out about after I heard my Lancastrian friend uh, declare his love for, you, for East Yorkshire. Thank you, John. If I said that, I didn't mean it. <laughs> um, John, there's a series of questions that people have asked, um, but I appreciate we're running a little bit late. Um, th there's one question that I think I, I will ask, and then the rest I'm afraid I'll defer to you to respond to in writing, if I may. And that's with regard to locations where uh, there are Article 4 directions in force or where there are conditions on permissions which restrict matters. Do the relaxations of PD rights uh, uh, affect that or will those still uh, remain in place? Well going back to the case the case in back 2000 2001 of Duguid that you remember probably grappled with this issue these are new grants of rights they are effective grants of planning permission under section 57 of the act so these rights now will take precedence the fact that a building may be subject to an existing condition will not prevent uh, an application being made for prior approval under under these uh, provisions. So in my view, if it's in breach of an enforcement notice or if it's in breach of um, conditions on the existing grant of planning permission, will not prohibit the submission application and appropriate determination of a prior application approval. Thank you very much indeed, John. Again, uh, clapping mentally, and I wonder if perhaps you could just stop screen at the moment and uh, I'll invite Stansy to come forward. Yeah. Hello, Stansy. Hello, thank you very much, Paul. Good afternoon. I'll uh, just start sharing my PowerPoint presentation. Jolly good. And um, whilst you're doing that, uh, I shall just introduce you. So Stansy is one of our up and coming stars uh, of the, uh, the, the, the King's uh, Planning Department. Uh, happily based over in Yorkshire, you'll see there's a theme to my uh, the degree to which I, I have a rapport with my uh, uh, fellow members of the department. Uh, and I say that because as part of the 2020 Chambers UK uh, references, Stansy is described as establishing a great rapport with the tribunal she's in front of. Well, this time around, uh, Stansy, you're in front of uh, 300 odd pa uh, participants who want to hear what you have to say with regard to the forthcoming changes to hybrid appeals and Section 319A of the Town and Country Planning Act. Over to you, Stancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. So it falls to me to set out the, provision, the provisions in relation to hybrid appeals. Um, so I'll make it fairly snappy because uh, I'm sure people are, are keen to get back to the rest of their working day. So hybrid appeals um, its an idea that first really came to prominence under the Rosewell Review. 
and the attentive uh, will remember that it was actually um, a point that was raised by various law firms and it's reflected in uh, Bridget Rosewell's report uh, that various law firms uh, raise the idea that hybrid appeals would allow different issues to be dealt with in, an, in a proportionate and appropriate manner and um, promoting efficiency and the proper use of time and resources. Um, the eagle-eyed will know of course that in Wales uh, the law already allows for a hybrid appeal process um, so this is Wales leading the charge on this one. I, don't, I haven't checked the participants to see how many uh, Welsh attendees we have but I'm sure it will be music to their ears to know that Wales was ahead of the curve on this one. Um, interestingly the Rosewell Review said that they didn't believe a change in the law would be necessary um, but advised keeping that particular proposition under review. Uh, the Rosewell Review thought that the real kind of potential of a hybrid appeal process um, wasn't currently being exploited and particularly endorsed the idea of a greater use of roundtable discussions, um, a greater use of a topic by topic approach uh, to the consideration of evidence and um, emphasised that it really should be the inspector's role to decide how areas of evidence will be examined um, and that the inspector should take a view on that and notify parties pre-inquiry. Uh, this culminated in recommendation nine under the review, um, which was a recommendation that the inspector decide at the pre-inquiry stage how best to examine the evidence and that the inspector should then notify parties of the mechanism by which each appeal, sorry, each topic or area of evidence would be examined. Um, and that could be a round table discussion, oral evidence, cross-examination, written statements, um, perhaps even some areas of the, of the process being done on a topic basis rather than a, a sort of witness um, basis. So uh, an article I'd strongly advise you to read, and I say article because it's technically a news story. It appears um, in the news story section of the PINS website, um, is uh, the, this um, news story published 26th of June, so very recently. Um, and its headline is virtual events remain for now, greater flexibility of events to be offered in future. Um, and in this uh, particular news story, PIN set out the emphasis on virtual events, um, but also this emerging process of hybrid appeals. They particularly flag that the, the hybrid appeal idea is intended um, to build on the Rosewell recommendations and to provide inspectors with the flexibility to consider all the evidence needed to make a fair and robust decision. Um, the uh, particular uh, reason that this news article offers for um, this approach now is that there is a uh, hope that this will enable appeals to happen more quickly um, and it will allow inspectors to be more flexible, which is particularly important given the current difficulties in operating physical inquiries and hearings. So there's a hope that this will um, achieve the kind of change um, within the system to allow for an, a more efficient and streamlined approach. And of course, they note um, that this brings us in line with, with Wales, where this flexibility is already in place. So what, what are the provisions in relation to hybrid appeals? Well, they're found at Clause 20 under the heading Procedure for Certain Planning Proceedings. Um, We've noted already that this uh, is already in place in Wales. So unsurprisingly, each of the amendments relate only to England. The amendments relate not only to the Town and Country Planning Act, but also to appeals under the Planning and Listed Buildings Act uh, and the Planning Hazardous Substance Acts. Um, and each of the amendments in, is in substance the same um, in that what the amendments allow for is that um, an inspector may now choose such one or more of the following ways as appear most appropriate for the determination of that appeal. So a true hybrid approach uh, and what we can all now expect moving forward is um, an appeal process that could be comprised um, of different types of um, process in, for different topics um, and for different parts of the evidence. So who decides? Well, under the Town and Country Planning Act, the person who um, is empowered to decide what uh, appeal process should be followed, uh, and at the moment, um, as I'm sure everyone here knows, there's, there's three methods, there's written representations, in, informal hearing or formal inquiry. The Secretary of State has the power to make that decision under the Town and Country Planning Act at section 319A. The decision is in fact made by the planning inspectorate, uh, and it's made in accordance with the procedural guide. And uh, there's a specific procedural guide um, that sets out how PINs approaches decision making 
on method of appeal. The latest version is dated 11th of March 2020. Um, I did check it late last night because uh, there's a grand tradition in these things of you know, the moment that you prepare a talk on something, the latest version of something is, is suddenly produced. Um, no uh, new version yet, but there absolutely will be, indeed there must be, um, for reasons I'll go on to explain. So if you haven't already acquainted yourself with this uh, particular uh, volume of Planning Inspectorate Guidance, um, I advise you to do so, but also to bookmark the relevant page and to keep an eagle eye on it for when the latest version um, is released. The key part for our purposes is paragraph 2.7 of the guidance, which states that the duty will be exercised, that is to say the duty um, of determining what the appropriate appeal process is, the duty will be exercised by PINs, taking account of the criteria for determining the appeal procedure, which is set out currently in Annex K of the guidance. Um, pause here for a moment to make one really important point. Um, this is a very useful case, the case of North Norfolk, and it, it's, a simple, it's a simple case for our present purposes because it makes one fundamental point. And the fundamental point is this, that the legal effect of the PIN's guidance was that the decision made on method of uh, appeal has to accord with the criteria unless PIN's decide that circumstances warrant a departure from the criteria, um, in which case there needs to be a reasoned explanation for any departure from the criteria and the PIN's guidance. Um, and it's in, uh, perhaps important to note that in North Norfolk, the parties were agreed that the criteria in the PIN's guidance um, were more than just factors to which regard had to be had by PIN's in making a decision. Um, the criteria in that guidance are in fact published pursuant to a statutory duty um, under section 319A6 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Uh, and the rules provide the options which the Secretary of State has and between which he may, which he may he or she may choose as he thinks fit. So the legal effect of the PINs guidance was that the decision has to accord with the criteria um, unless PINs decide the circumstances warrant a departure. So um, absolutely um, of the utmost importance that you become familiar with that guidance and that you um, bookmark the relevant uh, page on your computer if you haven't already done so. Um, because um, we now have uh, authority that underlines the importance of it. So let, perhaps helpful at this point to just do a brief reminder of what the three uh, appeal processes are and what the guidance currently says in relation to determinations, um, what sort of appeal would be appropriate um, for um, each of the different methods. So uh, under the current guidance, uh, the written representation procedure is appropriate when planning issues are clear cut and can be easily understood from documents and a site inspection. When issues are not complicated um, and the inspector is unlikely to, to need to test the evidence by questioning. And in the case of enforcement matters, where the alleged breach of planning control is clear and the requirements of the enforcement notice itself are clear. An informal hearing, perhaps unsurprisingly, somewhere uh, falls somewhere between the middle um, in terms of written representations and inquiry, but fundamental to the determination that an informal hearing is appropriate is the fact that the inspector needs to test the evidence or clarify matters. The appellant's status or personal circumstances are at issue, that's in relation to enforcement. Uh, a level of local interest and uh, parties being able to present their own cases, perhaps supported by a professional witness if required, but not uh, necessarily with an advocate. And in enforcement cases where the grounds of appeal, the enforcement notice requirements and the breach of planning control are relatively straightforward. Um, again, that's an indication an informal hearing might be the way to go. Public inquiry, um, last but not by no means least, a need for evidence to be tested by cross-examination. The issues are complicated, so for example, large amounts of highly technical data would be, is the example given in the guidance itself. Substantial local interest, uh, I think we're all familiar uh, with that one. Um, evidence needing to be given on oath, so where there is a uh, dispute as to key facts, um, or perhaps an enforcement case where it's necessary for matters to be proved um, to the relevant standard, um, and uh, witnesses might be called, for example, to deal with the issue of immunity or continuity of breach. Uh, and finally, in the case of enforcement, uh, alleged breach of planning control or the requirements of the enforcement notice are unusual and particularly contentious. 
So this gives a flavour for what the, uh, the sort of likely onward approach um, is going to be. But for a little bit more detail as to what's to come, we, can, we have a tantalising uh, teaser in the news story that was posted on the PINS website, to which I've already referred, which says this, uh, the ability to use a flexible procedure approach will allow our inspectors to decide on the scale of cross-examination or investigation um, via hearing required. For example, where parties have made good progress in narrowing down the issues, less cross-examination may be needed. Conversely, where an inspector is not satisfied that they can obtain the necessary information via written procedure, they can introduce a hearing and or cross-examination. So the two hints that we get from that article are um, firstly an inspector taking the view that they just don't have the information they need from the written documents and they're going to need some sort of oral process to elucidate the issues um, or, or secondly um, substantial amount of issues um, in conflict requiring cross-examination. I would suggest that the, there's something a little bit of interest in, in the wording there for example where parties have made good progress in narrowing down the issues less cross-examination may be needed. Um, I would suggest that that is a fairly clear steer for what we can expect to see um, going forward is some pressure um, in terms of case management uh, and some pressure on parties to narrow down issues and to really um, assist the inspector by identifying what um, issues actually require cross-examination and what points are, are genuinely in dispute. Um, so we might um, see quite a lot of emphasis going forward on the importance of a statement of common ground and that a statement of common ground shouldn't be just um, a race to the lowest common denominator, but a, a real attempt to narrow issues. When, uh, I think Paul has already uh, referred to this in the chat box, but um, the PINS article suggests that these new measures will come into effect in late July before the parliamentary summer recess. That seems pretty ambitious to me. And as Paul mentioned, uh, obviously there's the, the House of Lords um, second reading to contend with. Um, but I think what this does indicate is that there is pressure for this to come, uh, to come into force fast. Uh, in the short term, PINs advise that they're going to continue to plan and run events in a virtual capacity to protect staff and customers and maintain a stability of service. Um, so professional conduct, a reminder, and the reason why I pulled this slide up is I remember about a, a year or so ago now, John and I gave a talk on hearings and how to win them. Um, and we looked at some of the common issues that people face when they're um, preparing for hearings. Uh, and I think it's a timely, um, perhaps timely, just briefly um, to reflect on the fact that there is a tendency for when matters are dealt with by hearings or written rep, to uh, over relax or to think that a hearing is really a sort of fireside chat with an inspector or in the case of a written representations appeal there's no sort of face time as it were with a decision maker so um, perhaps things can be taken at a slightly more relaxed pace than they would with the preparation for an inquiry. Um, whilst it might be tempting to um, adopt that mindset if we are seeing a move towards this uh, hybrid appeal process um, clearly um, the people who stand to benefit most are those who are most prepared uh, and if you're told that part of your case is going written reps or hearing um, I would strongly suggest you resist the urge to relax in relation to that part of the case and, and specifically um, to I would urge everyone here to remember of course that you are if you are a professional witness likely to be bound by a professional code of conduct and that even if part of your case moves to written representations or to a hearing um, you will still be bound by that code of conduct uh, and you must still give the evidence um, that you believe, uh, it, the evidence that reflects your true professional opinion um, and is understood be, to be true to the best of your understanding and knowledge. Uh, and the fact that parts of the case may be being handled differently um, doesn't in any way um, compromise those uh, fundamental obligations. So what does this mean in practice? Well, the first point is early engagement. Uh, cooperation, case management and review of cases. So we can expect a pressure on parties to, to narrow the issues, to compromise, to produce meaningful statements of common ground. Um, it will also mean uh, preparation, 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 because of course, as any advocate knows, if you uh, have to uh, try and narrow the issues early on, or if you have to try and decide early on what is appropriate to be dealt with by way of hearing rather than cross-examination, 
we need early input on the case. Um, perhaps an increased use of the review procedure. So tucked away in the PINs guidance to which I referred, there is a uh, reminder that if you are dissatisfied with the method of appeal um, that PINs uh, elect, uh, choose, um, you have the right to a review by a senior officer. So perhaps we will see more appellants um, and even perhaps uh, respondent planning authorities um, availing themselves of that option where they're dissatisfied with the, uh, how different uh, decisions have been made in relation to a hybrid appeal. Uh, we await the detail. Um, we expect new PINs guidance imminently. Um, and this guidance is going to be key. As I've mentioned, it's statutory guidance. There's case law confirming its importance. So um, this guidance is going to rule the day in terms of how a hybrid appeal is divided up. Um, there's one further point that I perhaps haven't picked up in this, um, power, this particular slide, which is the rules. Um, the hearing uh, inquiry rules and written reps rules um, are, are currently uh, covered by different um, sets um, of uh, secondary legislation. Um, if we have a hybrid appeal, um, there could be a sort of awkward, an awkward consequence of a hybrid appeal could be that you are dipping in and out of different rules. You're dipping into the written procedures rules maybe one day and then you're into a hearing, uh, into a hearing and so you're covered by the hearing rules and then you're out into an inquiry. So then you're in the inquiry, inquiry rules. Um, that seems to be on the face of things quite unattractive. So I think we should also um, expect a, a new rework set of rules uh, for hybrid appeals, um, or certainly some sort of clarity as to how that's going to operate. So that is my whistle stop tour of hybrid appeals and what to expect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Stanzi. Uh, I've just got one quick question and we're gonna have a slightly unorthodox uh, 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 step back to Martin momentarily. Uh, my, my question is that, that I think at the very start of lockdown, you had the experience of doing a uh, a practice or mock virtual cross-examination um, uh, with a couple of witnesses, uh, just really to test it out, see how it would go. What was your experience of that? Uh, it was it was actually very positive, Paul. Um, it, I mean, you know, there were the usual sort of technological teething issues and you need everyone to be comfortable with the technology. But I think as long as there are sufficient uh, mechanisms in place that people are able to practice, um, become familiar with the process, um, and there is an emphasis also on, on you know, parties trying to help each other um, and help the inspector navigate um, what might be an unfamiliar set of technology. Uh, there's no reason to think that it, it couldn't be useful, um, except perhaps in the most complex of cases um, where you are, for example, sim simply sort of drowning in paperwork. Um, that might be the stage at which it becomes unworkable. But I would have thought for most um, cases, certainly with a steer that you should be narrowing the issues that are being cross-examined on anyway, um, there is a, a real prospect of using technology very effectively. Uh, thank you, Stanzi. And once again, I am mentally clapping, uh, as are half the audience. Uh, Martin, I think there was a, if you can bring yourself back on camera, you wish to correct something that you said. It's a self-correcting yeah. seminar. This is, this is value for money, if, if nothing else. It was um, Alan's question, which I um, engaged mouth before brain, really, I'm afraid. Uh, if we go back to the question, which was whether the extension to planning permissions in Section 93A and B covers permissions in principle, what I said was that I thought it probably would because they're not in the list of things that are excluded. But, of course, the first question to ask yourself is whether it's a, whether permission in principle is a planning permission at all, not whether it's on the list of ones that are excluded. And the Town and Country Planning Act, Section 329, defines planning permission and permission in principle in mutually exclusive terms. The, the things are kept dif distinct and different. So I think, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure now my answer was wrong, I'm afraid. I need to correct it. I don't think this bill says anything about permissions in principle and extending them. That's fantastic. Thank you for that, Martin. That, oops, so I'll bring myself back on. Can I bring everybody else online, obviously, with the exception of Sarah, who's since departed. Uh, so Stanzi and JV, if you'd like to just come online. Um, can I thank uh, all of the, uh, the panellists for what has been a very stimulating and interesting uh, afternoon. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, we are in the midst of a series of dramatic changes with more to come, uh, 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 as the Prime Minister has promised. And I think we have an interesting suggestion for a future seminar, which is what's our view of zoning and the possibility of uh, Jack Airy's ideas coming to the fore. Um, well, the more that, that the, uh, the world seems to be reformed in the planning sphere, the more there seems to be work for lawyers. So again, I'd normally be clapping away and inviting the audience to clap. So thank you very much. 
Uh, so for all those that have stayed with us, uh, thank you very much. I hope lockdown is going well. Uh, I hope that this has been a useful seminar. Uh, we'll send the slides through afterwards. Uh, if you email the clerks, if for some reason they don't meet, uh, don't get to you, they'll uh, make sure they'll send uh, those across to you. And Sarah's guidance notes will be available. And no doubt, looking at uh, the news that's been coming out over the last couple of days, we'll have another one of these in due course. But thank you very much indeed, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.